without mixture, without the mixture of the soul, without mixture of the flesh, Lord, without mixture of anything, Lord, a truly spiritual people that are led by the Spirit of God from beginning to end, Lord, would you do that in us, Lord, we pray. We're asking you, Lord, to do that work. Begin that work. Take Wherever we are in the journey, Lord, take us to a new level. We ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, thank you so much, worship team. Um, help me move this. If you move that for me. But um, just want to welcome everybody online, in person. And uh, just so glad you are here with us. And... Um, just, uh, thank you, Randall, but just, uh, just, I have a real expectancy for today and what God's going to do. Um, Josiah and Isaac are going to share, and they were sharing with me on the way here what the Lord has put on their heart, and it was just, it was really, really accurate, really spot on. Um, I know it's going to be good. I know what Josiah is going to be good because he drank, I made him, he's a Tennessee Vol fan. I made him drink out of a national championship Georgia mug, so... I had to give him the heart of a real overcomer because, you know, I just had to break that Tennessee ball thing off him because I wanted it to be anointed today. So anyway, um, it's going to be good, I know, for that, for a fact, because of that. So he looked, he looked great drinking from that mug, too, by the way. Um, also, we're going to take We're going to go ahead and take up the offering. So go ahead and have the ushers. So we're going to take up the offering. I think we learned from yesterday we're going to take up the offering first. No, I'm, I'm just a joke, but that's a joke, but... Um, that was a joke. I'm serious. I'm just kidding. But we're gonna, we, do, we do want to take up the offering. We, we want to really bless uh, Terry and Josiah. Really, it's important. It's really, really important that just what Scripture says, if you are receiving the Word of God from someone, from a teacher, from a minister, that you are to show double honor. And um, one of the ways we show double honor is by giving and blessing them. I mean, I don't know, you may not realize just how hard this kind of ministry is. If you've never done it, you probably don't have an idea how hard it is. Uh, you probably don't have an idea of the warfare that goes on behind the scenes uh, that would affect them and mentally, uh, physically, families, and the, the battles they go through. I mean, I'm speaking to, right, yeah, you witness. That. <laughs> I'm sure it's just the same with me, and um, obviously I'm not where they are, but I know just, just having to carry that is, is warfare, it's battles, it's, it's, it's draining, it's spiritually draining, um, it's challenging to uh, keep yourself up spiritually and then have to overflow from that to others. I mean, it, it is, it's a challenge, it really is. I'm not saying that to like, make you feel bad, but just to say we really want to bless and honor financially Terry and Josiah for the sacrifices they're making. So. Um, I want to pray over the offering, and we'll, just, we'll take up the offering. Um, if you want to make, uh, if you want to write a check, you can write a check out to Restoration Life. If you want to give, you can give online at give.restorationlife.org, give.restorationlife.org. If you're watching online, I want to encourage even those that would watch online to give this. Every, every penny that comes in for this conference is going to go directly to Terry and Josiah. We're not taking a, a penny. So you can, there's even links in the descriptions on uh, YouTube, if we're still on there, Facebook, uh, give.restorationlife.org. So I want to encourage you to be very generous in your, uh, in your offering. So let's pray. Um, Father, we just want to thank you and honor Terry, Josiah, and Isaac today, and the, the men of God they are, Lord, just incredibly uh, humble, loving men of God, and we are grateful for the way you have given them as a gift to the body of Christ and, Lord, just the fruit they are producing. Lord, I pray that you would move our hearts to give only what the Holy Spirit is saying to give, nothing more, nothing less. Lord, that, that there would just be, Lord, a, a generosity that uh, is released, we pray, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Amen. So while they're taking up the offering, I just want to just say one thing. Um, Last night, Terry mentioned the man-child, and he mentioned Revelation chapter 12. And if that's the first time you've ever heard that, it probably, you're probably like, what, in the, what on earth is the man-child, and what is the woman in Revelation chapter 12? But Revelation 12 is a very, very important uh, chapter. I believe it's one of the things the Lord is speaking, really speaking in this hour. Um, Terry did some excellent teachings a couple weeks ago on his website, Messengers of Shiloh. Uh, dot com, dot com, is it com or org? 
Rock.com. I want to encourage you to go check out those three teachings on Revelation 12. They're outstanding. I've been studying Revelation 12 since the mid-90s, and it's one of the best teachings I've ever heard on it. It's just really outstanding. Um, also, we have someone here who's transcribing the, those messages, spending about six to seven hours for each message transcribing it, because a lot of times when you're listening it, when you're listening to it on video or audio, it's just so much so fast, you really got to slow down and, and read it and study it. And so if you're interested in getting those transcripts, we're going to email it out to our, our email list. So if you want to be on our email list, uh, you can join our email list. Show the, Doug, show the slide or whoever, if you can. It's uh, the email, to join our email list is email.restorationlife.org email.restorationlife.org. So we're going to email those, those out next week. So if you are interested in that, just want to encourage you to uh, sign up for that. In fact, I think the time we live in with censorship, one of, email is probably the best way to stay connected because you just never know when things are going to just be turned off at the blink of an eye. So email, even though it's old fashioned, you know, it's, it's important to still to be on email list to stay connected. We need to stay connected with each other in this time we live in. Very much important that the remnant, those who are going out to the Lord, uh, stay connected. So anyway, um, what, I'm going to ask Isaac to come up. So Isaac, uh, sorry, I, I had this, um, this habit of like picking on people, but Isaac uh, came out today and I just was like, man, he looks so nice today. You've got to share something for 10 minutes. Um, so I have a teenage daughter and they start using all these words like drip and sus and lit and no cap. And I'm like, I don't know, you need a dictionary to understand what they're saying, but uh, it's not even in there. The urban dictionary for teenagers or something, but Anna likes to use this word uh, drip to describe people that look really nice. And, you know, Isaac came out today. I was like, man, you look so drip. You've got to share today. So Isaac is the most drip messenger I've ever met in my life. But, um, Sorry, come back and just, you can slam me all you want. So no, seriously though, Isaac, I, I, I just love Isaac. He is an incredible man of God, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. And I, I just, I, you know, just as we were drinking coffee together and stuff like that, just uh, hearing the, the wisdom the Lord's given him is just, just really amazing. And I think he's got something uh, great to share. He's going to share for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I told him that if he has more to share um, after 15 minutes, he can share tonight and also tomorrow. So anyway, just welcome Isaac. And then after that, Josiah is going to speak. And so Isaac will just uh, call Josiah up. So anyway, love you, my friend, and look forward to it. <laughs> no, no. We love you, Brian and Ken. I appreciate the, the time given up here. Um, I won't, I'll cut to the chase here. Um, I'm going to be coming out of Revelation three. Um, Brian had texted me uh, probably, what, like a week or so ago and just asked if uh, I would pray about sharing something. So I, I was before the Lord and I just felt um, actually in prayer, I heard a, a knocking um, on a door and it was, it was late at night and uh, no one was at my home. So I uh, went to Revelation three and the Lord uh, just started speaking. I'll read. I'll read the first here, Revelation 3:20. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. Referencing uh, some of what Brian said this morning about going deep and going to new levels with the Lord. Practically for me, um, what the Lord was just sharing is we have to allow the Lord to go deep in our hearts. We have to allow him to come in firstly. So how do we make ourselves ready as a bride? How do I make myself ready for the Lord? How do I, um, all these questions, how, 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 and like Brian said, you, the Lord does his part, we, but we also have a part to play. And in some of that, I believe, is this passage here. The Lord is knocking on the doors of our heart. This is to the later to see in church. This isn't to unbelievers as you all know this is to the church this is to our own hearts he's knocking on the door of our hearts and i believe he 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 showed me 
if we open that door, there's areas in our hearts, rather we know, some, I believe we know, there are some things in our hearts that we truly do know the Lord is working on, right? There's, obviously we're, we're imperfect. Um, and also there are areas in our heart that we may not know, but it's the deepening in the depth that the Lord wants to get at in our hearts. And I believe if we allow him in to come in and dine, if you would, to set in those areas in our heart where we may be resisting him, um, we're going to find ourselves being made ready. Those areas of disbelief or unbelief or resisting him is what's going to be keeping us from going deeper in him. It's going to keep us from, from really progressing in the Lord. And if we are being held back or we're being, um, let's, let's even just say, if we're being stagnant, we aren't progressing in the Lord. And the things in our hearts that we are holding back from him from fully taking over will keep us from going forward in him. And my cry of my own heart, I know, you know, it's the cry of y'all's heart, is not to keep things from him. When he puts his finger on things in our hearts, it's the immediate obedience that he's after. It's not, okay, yeah, let me, you know, let me have this for a little bit longer or, you know, was it really that, Lord? No, it, it is that. And that's what he wants. And when we come to the realization that that's where our transformation is going to be coming from is the immediate obedience and the immediate yes to the Lord. Because this is a journey. This is a, this is a, a process. We're not just done overnight. But as he reveals more layers and more layers of our heart and how wretched it is without him, that's what he wants to come in and fill with light. That, those are the areas that he desires. The, the difficult ones for us to give up is what he wants. And so in saying that, I, I, just, I, I believe if we can yield ourselves to him, if we can yield our hearts and lay down our own strength, our own ability to do, and we really truly allow him to come in those areas and to give over to him the areas that, that, we, that we're holding on to so tightly, he'll be able to do more in us and, and we'll be able to have him in a greater level. We'll be able to have him in a greater measure, I should say. And that's, that's my heart. I want to have him as much as I can in this life that I can. And the only way that that's going to happen is if I allow him to take hold of my own heart and take hold of the darkness that's within me and to drive out that darkness with his light. And, and uh, here uh, in 21 it says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also o overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe he is calling to us. I believe he's speaking to us. I believe that, as Dad was saying last night, if we can have an ear to hear, if we can have immediate obedience, something the Lord told me, and it's, it's so true, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Can we hear that? Can we let our hearts hear that? If, if, I, if the Lord is after something and I am not immediately obeying, I'm in disobedience. And if we do not obey him immediately, then I will be in disobedience until I obey. Guys, we don't want to be in disobedience even in the slightest. If I, hear, if I hear his voice, I wanna obey immediately. If he's after something in my heart, I, it's yours. I don't want it. It means nothing to me. There's nothing that he cannot touch, that he cannot take, that he, can, that he does not deserve, that I have, that I cannot give to him. And thus my flesh gets in the way and I keep it for myself. It's not worth it. The times Brian said it, Dad said it, Josiah's going to say it this morning. The times that we're living in, the times that we're coming into are, is beautiful, and I'm grateful for it, and I'm so thankful to be alive in it. But we cannot 
be held back in areas that we're unwilling to let go of. We can't. There's not, there's not time for us to, to get in God's way. I don't want to be in a wrestling match with the Lord. I'm, I'm tired of it. I've had my own wrestling matches with the Lord. I'm done fighting the Lord. Can we be done fighting the Lord? Can we be done resisting the Lord and be the bride making ourselves ready that he is so longed for and so desired for generations? Can we be that generation? Can we, like Dad said last night, can it not be because of me? If we all can be, if we all can be there together corporately, where we are standing and saying, let it not be because of me, then we are going to be made ready. If we can be obedient to the Lord and quick to obey, he will make us ready. If we do our part, he will be faithful to do his part. But let us not resist him in the process, right? I don't know where I'm at, but, but I, just, I, know, I know for sure that he is... He is calling us up and out of where we are and what we're in. And what, let, that, let him do it. Let him do the deep work. Let him take us to the next level in him. Not in ministry, not in glory, not in signs, not in wonders, but to the next level of him. Let his increase of light come by expelling the darkness that's within us. How do we do that, Isaac? Open the doors that he's knocking on in our hearts. Let him in. Let him dine in the areas of darkness that he can allow the light of bread of life for us to eat, to gain freedom or deliverance or a measure of Christ that we don't currently have. Amen. Amen. That's, you know, that's good. <laughs> the Lord is good. You know, he, he is good. I want that. I desire that. We have to have it. We have to have him. We have to have more of him. You know? The delay is because of us. You know, and when we really let that sink in, it hurts. If you really care about the Lord's heart and what he's after, if you really let that sink in, that the delay of the Lord is because of us, that should be heartbreaking. So, Lord, let it not be because of me. Let it not be because of us, Lord. Amen. Josiah. That was awesome, Isaac. Awesome word. Uh, we're having a little bit of mic issues. Are you okay to use this, this one here? Okay. Um, just connect that to your... Uh... You want me to do it? This is awkward. Where should I put it? No, I'm just right here? Yeah, oh, you can put it. Yeah, you can put it. You can just put it yeah, just wherever. Right there. I'm going to yell. I may go. Yeah. yeah uh, and then, yeah, you just turn it on right. Turn it off and on right there. Okay. Am I on? Oh, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Really good, Isaac. Thank you for sharing that. You sure you don't want the mic back? He was starting to get warmed up there. I was like, all right, I might get out of preaching this morning. That was really good, seriously. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, just even in that vein. Lord, we don't want to be, Lord, not only do we not want to be a stumbling block to others, which you spoke about so explicitly in the word, we don't want to be a stumbling block to you in the sense of resistance to your will. Lord, we're given such a short time on this earth Lord, like Moses says in Psalm 90, man, if he's you know, given strength and vitality, maybe he has 80 or 90 years. Lord, that's such a small time frame in reality to the eternalness of who you are and, and to time in general. We don't want to waste our time, and more importantly, I don't. I don't want to waste your time. Lord, we don't want to be vessels that, uh, and this is, I think, the essence of lukewarmness, who come partially out but don't finish the course, who go so far but uh, no further, who give lip service and say yes, 
but then return back. Lord, and you said in the scripture that uh, it's better to be those who say no in the beginning, count the cost, and then go and obey than to be those who say yes flippantly and then don't do what's asked of them. Lord, we want to say yes immediately, like Isaac was saying, and then follow through by yielding to the Spirit of God who alone can bring us to the fullness of the journey and the path that you have before us. Lord, I do pray that there would be no more delay. We would not be the cause of delay, but the spirit of delay would have no more power in your body, mainly because of the um, strength of our flesh and our soulish uh, attempts to give you what you want. I ask, Spirit of God, that you could deliver us and free us and draw us out of that former manner of Christian life. Bring us into the fullness of the Christ life and the Christ purpose and the Christ will. It's been there for eternity from the Father. The Holy Spirit has been given the task of accomplishing to make ready a helpmate for the Lord himself. I ask, Lord, that you would give us singleness of eye, not generally, specifically to you and to your purpose, that the dual foldness of this relationship to seek you, to obey you, the person and the purpose would be formed within us and would lead us, Lord, onward forever. You would be the true dictator of our lives. We would not be that, certainly not the governments of the earth, but you would dictate the direction, the purpose. You would be our pursuit above all other things. Like Isaac was saying, we would allow you to even pursue us to the inward man. We would have the courage to open the door of our hearts and allow you to come in. Lord, I know from my own heart, it's still a mess in there. I know my wife, <laughs> she's a very clean individual. She doesn't like it when people come over unannounced when the house is dirty. She likes the house to be clean. Well, Lord, the reality in this situation is... You're coming to knock when I'm not ready, necessarily. And my inward man is still very dirty. It's not cleaned up the way it should be. But that's not a condemnatory thing, Lord. It is a convicting thing. You have done a measure of work. Now I'm asking you, we're asking you, I'm asking you in your remnant to accomplish and complete the work. Finish the work. The work you began, if given the right opening, you will complete it. You will not bring us to the moment of birth and not allow us to give birth if it's by your spirit. And that's what we're asking for. A relationship inwardly that's by your spirit. ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are going to um, kind of jump right in this morning um, in Revelation chapter 12. This has been kind of, I was telling Brian this morning on the way over, this has been one of those times where, um, you know, I go through seasons, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't, um, where certain verses and certain concepts, I guess, um, that the Lord is revealing kind of dominates your whole frame of mind. And uh, Revelation 12 and the woman of Revelation 12, it's been kind of on me since before the conference um, this year. And so in praying about coming here and what to share, um, there are several things that I, that I had an idea to share. And uh, I believe the Lord... Uh, gave me something specific 
He spoke this to me about preaching out of uh, Revelation 12, um, verse uh, 1 and 2. And um, so if the message is terrible, we'll blame it on the Lord. No, no, <laughs> I blame it on my inability to get what the Lord wanted out of it. Um, so Revelation chapter 12, we'll kind of start here and kind of see where we finish. Now, my, my uh, intention today is not to give, and not, not that this is wrong, um, I actually was planning on speaking of a, uh, out of this passage in a more, um, I hate to say informational, but a more this means this, this means this in this passage type of message. And what I felt for this time and for this body um, because honestly, I'm just going to be perfectly honest, um, Brian and Ken have been teaching these dynamics for a long time um, very well. And so my attempt this morning is not to add to that dynamic, but more to call us into the reality of it. Amen? Amen. Um, there's a very important part of the aspect of preaching and teaching, and you can see this in the scripture um, and Paul says this to Timothy um, about encouraging him to preach sound doctrine, um, which gives us the ability to uh, be the salvation of our souls in the sense of searching out the person of salvation, Christ himself, in the scriptures. So it's important to preach and prescribe out of the scriptures, and there is enlightenment in the scriptures about certain dynamics that the Lord reveals. And this is one of those passages that the Lord has had and has, uh, has in the past and has been recently bringing revelation and understanding that I think is very important so we can understand what God wants, um, what he's asking for. But I also th believe this, the most important thing is not to just know about it, it's to know the Lord and become it. Amen? The two have to be coupled rightly, which is why the Lord brings revelation of the scriptures. But the most important thing, and I think really if we get down to the brass tacks of it, until we have revelation of Christ, we're not going to have the true revelation of the scriptures. Because the scriptures are pointing to a person and a purpose in that person. And if we can't see and we don't have a true revelation of Christ inwardly as the life, the source, the way, the truth, the life, not just conceptually, but inwardly seeing that and aligning with him by the Holy Spirit in that, we're going to miss it even if we understand it here. What good is it to me if we're in the time we're in and I can read about there being a woman in Revelation 12 that I believe is a remnant that is birthing the purpose and the will of God if not, I'm not a part of it. God just doesn't want us to understand what it means here and what this vessel is. He wants us to be it in this time. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing on God's heart. That's where... For us, the Spirit of God has to take us. Because the truth of the matter is, and the way I see it, and maybe you see it differently, um, everything hinges upon God getting his purpose in Christ in a people. Until that time, there will be delay. So it comes to us. You know, many of us have questions, and I get the questions. Questions, right questions are not bad. Um, we have questions, you know, and we have concerns, and we have our own beliefs of the times that we're in. I'm not here to try to convince you that the Lord is necessarily returning on a set time frame. What I'm saying is the time frame of God is set based on him getting the right vessel. We must come to the right question the way it comes to us. Will you be that vessel in my time? Or will I look to another generation? Will I look to another people who will be that? Now, Isaac said it this morning, that's not just an individual thing. Individually, since the coming of Christ, he has absolutely had individual 
vessels who have gone on that journey. And I believe there's been pockets within Christianity that have gone on that journey. But there has been missing a corporate reality of testimony in the, in the earth and most importantly unto God, the Father, where the Father sees a corporate vessel called Christ in His bride, cross, Christ in His body, in exact likeness in kind. And until that purpose is accomplished, we will remain in this current dispensation of time. When the Lord has a vessel that responds to His call and follows through in His purpose, counts the cost and endures the process of God, goes down that journey, then we will move along in time. Now time and the ending of time as we know it, is, know it is not my main focus and purpose. And it should not be yours either. However, if the ending of time is coupled with the purpose of God and Him getting what He wants, that takes it to another degree of concern for me. What do I mean by that? I mean my life is not just dictated on the Lord has to return in my lifetime. I want to be with the Lord whether we're in that time or not. And even if the Lord wasn't to return in our time, I want to be with the Lord and receive of the fullness of who He is and give Him what He wants. However, if time and God getting what He wants in His Son is coupled in the purpose, then it brings it to new light and new revelation in me. And the Lord honestly has been helping me understand that for some time. For, long, for far too long, I think, most of the body has gotten into this perception of being saved and then wanting to go to heaven or the Lord coming and ending this dispensation because of the reality of evil. And I'm not saying that at a level that's not good. I want the age of evil to be over just like you. However, if that's all we're seeing in that, we're missing the most important component. If that's all we're seeing in our end times eschatology is just the darkness and the evil and the Lord wanting to end evil. Dad was hitting on this last night. Then we're missing the most important component. We're missing the preponderance of what the book of Revelation is talking about and teaching. Dad said it again. I don't, I'm giving him credit. It's, it is a bridal chapter. This book of Revelation and it takes the Lord to reveal it, is about Christ and a people who've been made ready for Him. He has a people that wants Him beyond and above everything. And hear me, a people who've been willing to endure the process and the cost of that relationship. It's really easy to say we want it, so like Isaac was saying, the Lord comes in to the heart. I find in my own journey, and this is true of me, and still is true of me, um, zeal, be careful I say this, human zeal is really good at cutting off outward things we do to try and please God. Isn't that true? I've seen that in Christianity in certain times of history. It's still true in certain sects of what we would call Christ Christianity. And I'm not saying the Lord doesn't do that. Um, Paul is very clear in Corinthians to the Corinthians, stop sinning. But that was because of their immaturity. They still had uh, very outward, blatantly sinful things that not even unbelievers would, uh, would allow going on. They had incest going on right in the church. So that's, a, if I can say that, the Lord dealing with just outward sin dynamics um, is very real and very necessary. However, that's just the beginning. Where the rubber really hits the road is when the Lord goes to the inward man to start cleaning house there. And I find this true uh, of many, and I find, found the temptation in my own life. That's when 
uh, it really gets down to, am I going to stay in this aspect of the journey or am I going to run back to the safe place of Christianity? It's really easy to impress people with all the things you don't do. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in God being impressed with the measure of his son he finds living in my inward man. The outward will take care of itself if Christ is my life. If we shoot for the outward, God shoots for the heart. God looks to change us from within to without. God looks to give us a new nature and to deal with our soul so that that nature, that life can come through. Spirit, soul, body. The flow of the life of God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. When that's accomplished, the Lord's coming back. He has the helpmate that will sit with him on his throne, Christ's throne, not the Father's throne, Christ's throne, the Son of Man, Son of God's throne, in union that he can share the administration of the universe with. He can trust that vessel. So, that's, not, we're not even, in, haven't read any scripture yet. So, but that's where I'm coming from this morning, though, to help us. If we just stop at information, if we just stop at information, we're not going to be made ready, and we're not going to be a part of the vessel the Lord wants. I personally believe, and you, you don't have to believe this, I personally believe we're at the stage in history where God's going to get a remnant. Question is, is I'm, I'm going to be a part of it. That's my belief. You don't have to believe that. I'm not saying you do. What I'm saying you do need to believe and understand is that God has a purpose to have that vessel. You may not believe in the time frame, but you need to understand the purpose of God in this. Because if you don't, you're going to miss the reason you were created. The reason God's put you in this time. So, Revelation chapter 12, verse number 1. says here, And a great sign appeared in heaven, or in the heavenlies. Now one, I mean, right off the bat, we should understand that this woman, this vessel, is different. This is a Philippians chapter 3 vessel that's journeyed in the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That hasn't stopped, that's pressed on. As Paul told us to press on, as Paul himself was pressing on, this vessel has pressed on and into and through to be in an elevated position called Mount Zion with the Lord. It says, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. There's so much in there. I said I wasn't going to get into the weeds of all that and what I believe all that means. This is what I want to get to. And she was with child, and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, in coming here, the Lord told me, you're going to speak about the cry of the woman of Revelation 12. And me being a human, my first thought was, well, I think she's crying because it hurts. <laughs> that's all that is, right, Lord? No, that's not all that is. That's what I think. <laughs> Though it does hurt. The cross hurts. Doesn't it? Yes. Being in labor and in pain to give birth. You know, I want to understand that the difficulties and the trials of life that the Lord puts me through, not that Satan attacks. I want to resist the devil when Satan attacks. I want to embrace the cross when the Lord administers it. Now, Satan being allowed to attack has purpose. It teaches us to fight and to contend rightly by the Spirit. We have to learn that. We have to understand, I think, in this time, and I spoke about this during the conference in uh, July, and I might have not have done a well enough job, but 
we have to understand the nature of God as lion and lamb because we're coming into a time frame, and I believe it's already here, where the Lord is going to be coming through his people as a lion. Resisting darkness, resisting evil. For certain ones of us, even a part, and I think for this, this, the dynamic of the woman and in true intercession, praying rightly the judgments of God in this time upon evil. Some of that redemptive, some of that wrath. You can see the people of God in the book of Revelation rejoicing and praising God for his righteous judgments upon the earth. Now that offends our overly graced Christian mindsets, doesn't it? We have, uh, in this nation, had a, a tremendous understanding and revelation of the grace of God. And I believe in the true grace of God. And I believe in emphasizing the true grace of God. I do not believe in promoting one aspect of God over the other. I don't. I do not believe that. I do not believe that God is more love than he is a consuming fire. I believe God is who he is. Now, I do not believe that God loves to pour out his wrath. He doesn't because he's full of loving kindness and he does not wish to have to do that. However, God is not moody as humans are. God has modes of operation that he enacts and engages. If you do this, repent, you receive of my grace. If you do this and do evil, you get this. God loves all creation. He loves the dog and the cat, but he doesn't love it as much as humanity. There's different levels of God's love, different levels of God's judgment. I for one, do not want to fall in the trap of only loving God the way that I want to love him. Only being able to receive of the Lord the way that I want to receive of him. That's called creating God in our own image. And then it begins to beg the question, are we love, in love with the true God or are we in love with the God of our own vain imagination? I'm not saying anyone in here believes that. I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to be clear. So, um, purpose, purpose. The woman cried out, being in labor and in great pain. Um, this journey with the Lord is going to cost us what? Everything. Your own life. Those who seek to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my name's sake will find it. Find their own life? No, find the life. Find him to be their life. And when his life, and in that life, there is great eternal purpose. We have to understand this because of the individualism that is in our nation and has been promoted in our nation and is in the church. We have to understand that it's not just about you and your relationship with Jesus. God is looking for a corporate man, a corporate vessel, a body. Now, that's not just geographical, that we all need to be together in one place. Though I am finding, and maybe you're finding this as well, that the Lord is seemingly moving people in this time to be closer together. There's multiple reasons for that. One of it's the impending judgments. He's getting people out of certain areas. Because they're places of destruction. Well, Josiah, I'm not sure that's biblical. Well, read Revelation 18. Come out of Babylon, my people, lest you be a partaker of her with her sins. If you don't get out, you're going down with the ship. Now, I know that, you know, in our minds, <laughs> trying to be careful here, there's always exceptions to rules. We're so used to in this nation, I think, we kind of go where we want and live where we want, or we ask, Lord, I, you're just going to have to really tell me where I need to live. And I'm not saying that's wrong. That's, you should ask that. 
However, there's also called something that's, that's the spirit of wisdom. And like Lot's time, which is the time we're in, Jesus said the times we're coming into were like the days of Noah, the days of Lot, right? You have to have, wis have, to have wisdom. When you see the judgment at the door, like Jesus said, you better get out. If you're in Jerusalem and you see this taking place, flee to the mountains. You don't have time to go ask the Lord, well, where should I go? Get out. Or you'll die. That's what Jesus is trying to tell him. Not that you'll lose your salvation. You're going to die. Now, I don't mind dying if it's the will of God. But I don't want to die in this time because there's something he in this time frame that is reserved for the vessel. An aspect of the Lord and the Lord coming through his people in this time that I want to be here for. I don't want to die prematurely because I was not either obedient to the word of the Lord or filled with the wisdom of God to understand the truth that God judges evil. And if I acquiesce even geographically to that dynamic, then I'm in danger. Yeah. have to understand that. We're not used to that type of talk right there. I'm not. Most of my life, you know, I'm only 34 years old, but I've been in the church since I was born. You know, the language is always, well, I got to hear from the Lord directly where I need to go. I agree in the time we lived in the past. I don't agree anymore. Now, I'm not saying where you go necessarily, you shouldn't ask the Lord, but where you're at, you don't need to ask the Lord if you need to leave. If it's certain places, you just need to flee. I'm talking about the entire West Coast, flee. Talking about the East Coast, especially up north, flee. Don't wait. You know, there's two ways this can work because I believe this is going to happen. The Lord's going to cry out one last time to his people who are truly his to flee if they'll hear, if they'll heed, if they're not in unbelief and unwilling to hear so that their lives can be saved at the last minute. But they're going to flee with their shirts on their back. If, if people will heed the word of the Lord and the wisdom of God now, they can leave with more than just the shirts on their back. They can be a storehouse and a place, place of refuge and not lose everything God has given them. What's that have to do with this message today? I don't know. I don't know how I find my, myself here. Uh, the spirit of Terry must still be up here on this pulpit somewhere. So we're just going to cast that off. And cost, cost. It's, it's, there's great cost in this time to be a part of the, the Lord's vessel. So, um, and again, this dynamic of crying out, I, I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is very much so, if, if we have ears to hear, like Isaac said, ears to hear. And that's, that's the hard part of this. Not everyone's going to hear or heed. I hate to say that. We don't have to have the same language. We don't have to have all that. But hear me. What's reserved for the end for the majority of the body of Christ, and I do not like saying this, but this is just the Bible and I can't get around it, is apostasy, not revival. The revival I see, the revival I see even here in Revelation 12 is a woman that has come out to the Lord that has an inward cry for the spirit of God's perfect and pure work to birth what God wants in the earth. Yes. Now that's a revival, yes. even in my own heart because I'm not there. But that's the pressing of the spirit of God. What's reserved for those who will not take that journey, and I hate to say this, but Jesus said it. Paul said it, 2 Thessalonians, the great apostasy. That's kind of where, where it's going. Apostasy in what, in what way? Well, here's really what's being challenged, and I hit it earlier. Who is Jesus Christ? And what does God want in Christ? When you really whittle it down, you can see this in 2 Corinthians 11. I was planning to go there. I'm not sure if we will. I was mentioning the deception last night. 
What's being offered to the church is another than Jesus. This is verse 4. Another than gospel. Another than spirit. If it was there in the beginning, we must realize and understand that it will be here in the end. What form does that take? Many forms. Many forms. Part of it is religion versus Christ himself. Being the author, the perfecter, the source of our life. I said this before. Many Christians have the skill set of Christianity. We know how to do Christianity. We know how to do church. We don't know the Lord. Christianity has become a skill set. You do these certain things, you act this way, you do this, you get these results. That's Christianity. Christianity is nothing of that sort. Christianity is Christ living in a vessel and being their life. That is Christianity. A vessel that, here, here it is, this is what we don't see far too often, maybe in my own life, the expression of the nature of God through a vessel called fruit. That's Christianity. That when people see your life, when people see you, they see the essence of Christ. They see the person of Christ. Now, we're on a journey called the cross because most of us, if you're anything like me, we have a duality of the lives that we live from. <laughs> on a good day, normally, we're living from the Lord's life. On a bad day, it's more my life. And the fruit bears out. But the Spirit of God is committed to a journey which requires the cross to make that not so. Where the only life that we're living by and the only life we're expressing is Christ's life. Not that we don't have a personality, but that everything is under the hand of the Lord. And He is the complete government of our life. So embrace the cross. Do not be afraid of the cross. It is the tool of God for conformity. Do not create your own cross. All you'll do is do outward stuff and it won't accomplish anything but make you prideful. What do you do? Isaac said it this morning. Open the door to the Lord. Take the barriers off. Pray the dangerous prayer. Lord, whatever it takes for you to get what you want. Now, I'm thankful to the Lord because he's being more clear what that means. He doesn't want us not to know what he wants. He wants us to know. Why? So we can align to him, with him in his purpose. So, Josiah, what's the Lord looking for? An open womb. That's what he's looking for. That's what he here, has here in Revelation 12. An open womb to him. You can see this in 1 Samuel, and we'll turn there quick. I don't want to get, I don't want to read all of this because we'll be here uh, a while. You see this in 1 Samuel chapter 1 with Hannah. And a beautiful story, but uh, you see here in Hannah, a desire for God's will to be birthed in Samuel. You know, and we read this passage and we think, because this is true of the culture of that time, if you didn't have a child, you were considered not blessed and you were a reproach to your husband. But Hannah's burden was not just that. Hannah's burden had understanding with it and purpose to it. That Israel was in decline. That the priesthood, Eli and his sons, were fat and old and blind. It did not understand the purpose of God. So Hannah, whether you believe this or not, allegorically, metaphorically, spiritually, this is true. Hannah had understanding that no one else in the nation had. That a man-child, a vessel, Samuel must come Forth, And she was completely unselfish in that desire. How do you know that, Josiah? Because she told the Lord, he will be completely dedicated to you. He's not my child. He's your child. 
That child, Samuel, played a vital role in the process of David, the true king, coming to the throne. What am I saying? I'm saying that unless the Lord has a woman like Hannah where her cry, her burden, her groaning, like Romans 8 burden, excuse me, to see the redemption of God in her time, their time, unless that comes forth, the chain reaction will not commence. There is a certain reality that when the Lord gets the remnant, the bride, thank you, Isaac, <clears throat> and she comes out, the man-child comes forth, the Samuel vessel comes forth, and that begets the Lord coming forth and coming back to rule upon the earth from Jerusalem and the throne there for the millennium to begin. That is the chain of events that are biblically to take place. And you see it all the way back in the beginning. Josiah, this, that seems so vague. How do you get that at the, out of the scriptures? It begins in Genesis with Adam not having a suitable helpmate. And God puts Adam to sleep, puts Adam into a form of death and takes the rib and forms the woman, a helpmate that is prepared and that is his kind. It's exactly what we're seeing here. That's spiritually what the Lord is trying to bring forward in a people. That's why the press of the, the Spirit of God upon us. That's why the intensity. For some of us, that's why we've come out of just the normal Christian thing because we understand that there's more. There's a groaning in our own inward man that there's something God wants that he's not getting. And I don't understand all of it. I don't know all of it, but I know the Spirit of God pressing me. I'm trying to bring some clarity to that. Maybe we don't need it here. Clarity to that pressing. Clarity to that purpose. To give us a vision beyond just where we are today or where we've been in the past. So Hannah here in verse 10 Again, let's tie this in with Revelation 12. It says, She was greatly distressed and prayed to the Lord, and she wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, this is verse 11, if, if indeed thou will look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but will give thy maidservant a son, a man-child, Seed, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And a razor shall never come on its head. Now, again, Eli is there while she's in the temple of the Lord praying this prayer. And she, he thinks she's drunk because he's reading her lips. And she's not, but she's not making any, uh, any noise. So she, he thinks she's drunk. He has no understanding of what's going on with Hannah. That's right. He's doing his priestly stuff. He's doing the stuff that he's known to do for years that's been passed down to him. I mean, so what? He's, he's, his, his sons are drunk and worthless. So what? He's blind and lazy and has no understanding of the will of God in his time. It should have been Eli on his knees weeping bitterly for God to bring forth the will of God, not Hannah. Let me, let me tell you something. This is something the Lord told me, and I never saw it until, uh, until he showed it to me. You know, John the Baptist was supposed to be a part of the, Levi the Levitical priesthood, as his father was, Zechariah. That should have been his order. He rejected that order for a different order, to make ready a people for the Lord, to make a way ready for the Lord. It doesn't talk about it in Scripture, but you better believe that he got a lot of flack for that. People telling him, well, John, this, this is the known will of God. You are in a very special line and class of people to be a part of this. And we have the temple and we have... You know, the golden altar, and we have this, and we have that. We have all the stuff. You need to be a part of this, John. And John said, no, I'm going into the wilderness 
because the Lord has earmarked me for this time. This is not a time like other generations. This is not a day like other generations. This is a day where the Lord is going to do a new thing, or better yet, the thing that he's always wanted to do. Brothers and sisters, the Lord's not trying to do something new in that sense in our time. He's trying to accomplish something that's been his heart, in his heart for eternity. It's never not been in his heart. Regardless of the fall, the vessel that we're talking about here in the woman, that her own only cry, her only desire, her only purpose for existence is the will of God. Don't get bogged down when I'm saying this and looking at yourself and saying, that's not how I live daily. Guess what? I have the exact same struggle. What I'm telling us is what is the goal of the Lord and the encouragement in this is the Spirit of God is given to see that it comes forward. We must yield to it. We must bow to it. In this day, we must lose so many other purposes that have been laid upon us by the, the Christian church, much less the world. Don't flee your workplace. Don't flee your job. The Lord does a tremendous job of pruning and testing and teaching in the workplace. It's not a call to ministry except for ministry to the Lord. It is a call, though, I'll say this, it is a call for the purpose of God dominating all other purposes. It is a call for the, the church of Jesus Christ to come together with one voice, one purpose, being one body to birth the will of God in our time. That is the unity of the Spirit that we need. Brian and I were talking about this this morning. And I believe the Lord has this for you guys here. Has it for us at back at the gathering? Has it for all those who are journeying on in the Lord and who want to journey in the Lord as a corporate body? A unity of the Spirit that is not just about us liking each other and being nice to one another. That's not the unity of the Spirit that we need. Now, we need to love one another. We need to be kind to one another. We need to show the fruits of the Spirit to one another. But the Lord has earmarked this body to be united in one purpose, to be a vessel, a womb that would birth the will of God, that would stand and pray, and not just pray, but become that vessel in this time. That's the unity that the Lord is wanting. That's the unity I believe the Lord is offering you guys, a deeper level of that. I'm not saying none of that's going on. I'm just saying I think the Lord wants to take it to the next level. The Lord wants to remove the shroud of misunderstanding and enlighten our eyes spiritually to see the hope of His calling. And the Lord has not called us in this time, regardless of your vocation, regardless of your job and the requirements. The Lord has called all of us to be joined with Him in this purpose. It's a spiritual purpose. But it has outward costs, doesn't it? It is worth it. Amen. So, uh, so we talked a little bit about Hannah. Let's go over to Second Thessalonians. I wanted to, to hit this, kind of reinforce what I'm talking about. Um, just in the dynamic of what the Lord's waiting on. This woman, this cry, this inward groaning. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, of course, Paul's obviously talking about and giving the Thessalonians um, a rehash of what's going to be happening at the end. But I just want to kind of reiterate verse 6 and 7. When speaking about uh, the Antichrist and the time in which he is to, to be revealed, and Dad said this last night, and honestly, this is, it's really beautiful to me. 
I love the fact that the enemy is not dictating the time. The Lord is dictating the time. Doesn't that just give you a level of, maybe we need it, maybe we don't, confidence in the Lord and trust in the Lord that the end times or the end or whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't even necessarily like calling it the end times because that's been so overused. But the beginning of a new day, maybe that's what we should call it. The age wherein dwelleth righteousness is potentially on our doorstep. That's to be excited about. Um, so anyways, verse 6. Again, the context talking about the Antichrist and the, the time in which he is to, to be revealed. Paul, Paul tells them, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. Now, two things are said here. Verse 7, it says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So it was already at work in that time. The enemy was already trying to do what he was doing. They knew that partially because of what was going on in Rome. They also knew that because of the false teachers. What John says, many antichrists are already among us, and they went out from us. False teachers, lying spirits, corrupting the children of God. There was already a level of, can you imagine this? And this is true. We don't think this way. Apostasy going on in the early church, specifically to Gnosticism and Gnostic teaching. It didn't take long. Paul says it's already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I just want to help us with these passages for a second because I, I personally am a commentary guy. I like to read commentary. I don't like to reinvent the wheel if I don't have to. However, um, if you do not have Christ and the eternal purpose of God inwardly locked in your inward man, this is my personal belief, you're not really going to be able to understand the Bible in a real way. Again, that's spiritual. That's not just I know it. That's a revelation inwardly of that. But what Paul's trying to tell us here is that there's something because the he is God, the what is is the woman, Revelation 12, God's purpose. There's two things said there, a what and a he. The Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, is restraining the revelation or the revealing of the Antichrist until the what, the vessel, is made ready. Those two are intricately locked together. So God is at work to bring something forth, not just Satan. Satan, hear me, the reason that the Antichrist goes out to deceive and to deceive the nations is to stop the bride from being made fully ready so that his kingdom can last on the earth. Satan does not, he's not so stupid to believe that um, God cannot remove him if he wants to. He knows that. But what he understands, and we must understand, is that God has a purpose that he is married to in a vessel called the helpmate. And if that vessel is not made ready according to the covenant specifications by the Holy Spirit, accomplished by the Holy Spirit, then there will be a continued delay of this dispensation. So the desire of Satan is to deceive and to apostatize those of God's people. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I know that flies in the face of a set time, a set date, where the Lord's just wait, waiting, whatever, for the measure of evil to fill up. That's not what he's waiting for. Amen? Amen. How do I know that? Well, because he preserved Noah and his sons through the flood. God was waiting on something. He could have just restarted. He could have just restarted with Adam and Eve. He's committed to something. Part of it is approving 
to Satan, to the universe, of God's ability to accomplish the impossible. Take a created vessel, a stubborn, stupid human vessel, us, and fill it to all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3.19. Not to make us God, again, but to make us filled with God. To make us a vessel where we are inhabited by God. So the Spirit of God is restraining the enemy while also trying to make us ready, while also doing the conforming work of God, while also bringing us to death in our self life, but bringing forward the life of Christ. But the fly in the ointment in all this is always. This one word, choice. There has to be a vessel that equally chooses the Lord the way he has chosen her. We can wrangle about words and doctrines and all that nonsense, but it gets down to this reality. Do we want the Lord and do we fully want the Lord? And are we willing to go on that journey and pay the price or not? And that will be proven in the journey. We cannot get around the fact that the preponderance of the New Testament books is pushing the early church to press on to fullness. Amen? They were trying to do something in that day, that vessel, that John the Baptist type vessel that the Lord had in Paul and Peter the disciples, they were trying to make the church ready because they understood that the day of the Lord was involved and was aligned with that. What's the point of trying to press the church on if the church doesn't need to be pressed on? Why waste the time? You know, it's like I tell people, the universalists who talk about, well, Jesus died for everyone and you know, he's the savior of all, especially those who believe, you know, twisting the scriptures. And I'm like, if everyone's saved and they don't already know it, I don't understand why Paul is suffering and being beaten and being murdered for preaching the gospel. And if the church is ready, why is he doing that? Well, you can say, well, he was evangelizing. No, he wasn't just doing that. He was going back to the churches that had been established to fill up what was lacking in their faith. To bring forth a mature man. We'll read that in a few minutes. Brothers and sisters, I believe this. It's come to us. Can we hear that from the Lord? Does that have any resonance with us? Does that resonate in our inward man at all? I think it does. But the Lord is offering and inviting. He has been. This is not new. But I do believe he's placed us in this time, knowing that we would say yes. That's my prayer. That's why I'm up here preaching. That's why I'll continue to preach this message. And if the Lord delays because of human choice, my job, my purpose will be to continue to preach this message till my dying day when I go to be with the Lord and pass it on to the next generation that they would not be a generation that fails the Lord. Amen? I'm not saying that to be heavy on us. I'm just saying that's the reality. I'm that convinced of what I'm saying. I'm that sure. I'm not just basing it on an outcome. I'm basing it on the Bible and the revelation of the Bible and the way men and women of God preached the message of Christ and his purpose and his coming. More, now more so than ever, more so than ever in my journey, I understand why we must preach the return of the Lord because it is intricately and forever coupled with the message of the purpose of God in a vessel in readiness. It's not just, and this is not right, I don't, I don't believe this, it's not just to get out of something preaching the return of the Lord. Not just that we get to go to heaven or the Lord gets to come here and evil is put away. Not that that's not good. 
But when the Lord gets what he wants in a corporate bride, then the end will come. When a bride is made ready, then the Lord comes. We have to have that right push in understanding. Amen? Amen. So, um, and again, I, I believe that that's happening. I really do. I'm not sure how much it's happening in the West. But across the whole earth, I think it's happening. May we not be, this is my prayer, may we not be a runaway bride. Amen. It gets to the altar and flees. Because there ain't no pre-trib rapture. And we're going to go through the tribulation. And we're having an opportunity. If we don't have the Spirit of God in perseverance and do not understand the purpose of even the tribulation to continue to make us ready, we're going to flee. The deception... The spirit of deception is going to be stronger than we think. And Dad referenced this last night, and I believe this. We've had conversations about this. This may not come the way we think. Amen? You know, we've had a lot of movies and a lot of shows about what's going to happen and how the Antichrist is going to reveal himself and how he's going to come across and how he's going to ask people to worship him. We've had a lot of that. Most of that is based, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, and it's based around just the mind, mind of man. I like to look at, because I believe this, history. If Satan has been trying to institute his own man to rule the world for a long time, and he has throughout history, Paul even says that there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, He's trying to do this. He's trying to rule. He's trying to have total authority so that he can keep his kingship on the earth. Um, I like to look at history. I like to look at places like Nazi Germany. I like to look at the communist nations. I like to look at places where dictators have essentially, North Korea even now, become God and how people respond to that. The way that that happens doesn't come obvious. It comes with deception. If it wasn't deceptive, no one would be deceived. It's logical, right? It's like sin. Why am I saying that? Because I'm afraid that it's going to come more so in governmental dictatorial authority in compliance than in what dad talked about last night bow down to me and claim me, claim me as your God our allegiance to a system above the Lord yes. now do we see what's going on in this nation the spirit that's in this nation now can we look back through history honestly and see how Satan has done this again and again and again? He's not going to do something different. It's just going to be on essentially steroids. It's the same tactic. He doesn't have a new plan to deceive people. Why would he? It's been working for a long time. Where is his authority? Outwardly in government. He wants control of the money. He wants control of uh, the military. He wants control of politics. And the fourth one, we don't like to hear this, he wants control of religion, including the Christian one. How is he going to deceive God's people who are really God's people, not just in name only, because that's what the scripture, scripture says. You can't be apostatized if you weren't really in the Lord. It's just called false faith. Anyway, I know people argue that. People a lot smarter than me with a lot more degrees than me would say differently, but I don't really care. Sometimes we just need some common sense. You know what I mean? You don't have to be an egghead to understand the scriptures. <laughs> Sorry. Egghead. You know, I have a big head, so I shouldn't say that, like, naturally speaking. I used to, my uh, uncle used to call me Buckethead, so. <laughs> I don't know any, I don't need any inward deliverance from that. At least I don't think so. Ken, Brian, you, y'all let me know afterward. But anyway, uh, deception. Satan is coming as an angel of light, and he's coming through vessels as an angel of light. He's not coming with the obvious. I'm not saying the scripture is very clear that he's going to take his place above all 
so-called gods to be worshipped. But we have in our perception a way of worship that I don't think is going to be that way. I may be wrong. I think it will probably be both aspects. Um, but I know this for sure. None of us in this room are going to see the Antichrist physically before us and he's going to say, bow, bow down to me. That's not going to happen. He's going to be in a central place in Europe. You may see him on the television. You will. But it's not going to come that way. You know, gather everyone in the whole world to me, and we're going to have a big session where I tell everybody to bow down to me. You know, and one felt that's not the way that's going to happen. It's not the way it works. One of the greatest forms of the Antichrist spirit is actually in communism. Did you know that? Why? Because government is God? Yes. People say it's atheistic. It's not. The government's God. And the leader of the government is God. Whatever he says goes. Everything goes to him. Your money, your time, your energy, your life is all bound up to that system and to the leader of the system. I'm not trying to be political. I'm really not. I'm just telling you the truth of the way Satan works. Who's at the top pulling the strings? That's why I appreciate God's will in this nation so much. It really has nothing to do for me um, with keeping our place of prosperity in this nation, which I'm thankful for, of not allowing bad things to happen in this nation. It has to do with this. God gave wisdom to men, imperfect men, many of them men of God, men of how to keep Satan's hands off the government. It's called our Constitution and the founding of this nation. To where there was a divvying out of enough power where Satan could not easily get a central man and people in place to corrupt it, to bring it under his authority. That's really the truth. I don't care if you believe that or not. That's the truth. That's been a journey for me to understand that, honestly. That's why I can speak, I can speak about it that way. Because I've thought differently in the past. The Lord's really corrected me. It's not a pro-America thing necessarily. It's an understanding of the way Satan operates. To be wise as a serpent in this time. Harmless as a dove. So, again, how did we get there? <laughs> Vitally important. You know, and I want to say this. I have found, and I've seen this a lot in traveling, the Lord has been stripping us of so many wineskins. Some of them have been him. Some of them have not. Um, he's been even dealing with things and restricting things and curtailing things that are um, talked about in the scriptures. I'm talking about outward things, uh, power, prophecy. But that's been unto a purpose, and we have to see that. Especially when dealing with the things of God. God's not restricting those things because they're evil or they don't have a place. They do. But God has been meeting us where we're at. And meeting us at the foundation. of Christ and Him crucified. So all the difficulty of the stripping and the process of stripping is unto a purpose greater than just the stripping itself. It's leading to something. You know, I know when we get in that time, in those times, you know, we, we worry about getting out of balance in the Lord. And that's not wrong. But I also understand this that uh, if we're in balance and wrong understanding, then maybe we need to be thrown out of balance. Maybe we need to be thrown off the horse that we've been riding for so long and isn't giving God fully what he wants. Maybe the Lord is intentionally trying to bring us out of our so-called Christian balance so that he could make us single of I. 
so that we could be a vessel in this time who is sold out to birthing the will of God and is not going to make the lesser than things the main thing, but is going to make the Lord and what He wants the main thing. You know, you can go after ministry and you can go after the stuff. And I don't want to me I say this wrongly because the Lord is compassionate and He loves people. He does. The Lord, I believe this, the Lord loves to heal His people. The Lord loves to touch His people. We were praying for healing last night. Dad, probably going to talk about it more. We, we're going to need that dynamic in this time. However, that's the Lord meeting a need. When is there going to be a vessel that arises that sees God's desire? Need isn't the right word, but God's desire. And matches him in that. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be with the Lord. For far too long, at least in the Western church, we've tried to meet people's needs for the Lord. Rather than, Lord, what is it that you're after? What is your purpose? Why does the church exist? Why do you want to live inside of us? Why did you create humanity? And why have you tarried with humanity for so long? Because you didn't have to. They've easily restarted after Adam and Eve. What are you doing? What are you working towards? If you have a main thing you're working towards, I want to be with you in the main thing. I want to miss you by making the secondary dynamics the first. It begins with the preeminence of the person of Jesus Christ. So, the woman crying out. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 4, verse number 19. You're all very familiar with this passage. I'm in travail or labor or in birth pangs, childbirth, until Christ is formed within you. Paul's push here in this passage is to see the right vessel come forth. Yes, to give the Lord what He wants, but yes, to make a people ready to see the day of the Lord too. I'm not trying to wrongfully tie those together. I'm trying to rightfully tie those together so we have understanding of part of the purpose and requirements for that day to come. Why? Because I believe we're in that time of the Lord asking us to be that. This church right here, to be that to the Lord. And it's time, brothers and sisters, hear me in love. It's time to lose the other purposes that confuse us and distract us. It's tr time to lo lose and allow the Lord to deal with the wrong questions. Time to ask the right questions. Right questions are okay, right, Brian, right, Ken? Right questions are okay. Wrong questions are not. What is a right question? What is a wrong question? Well, I'll let Brian speak about that sometime. <laughs> I'll tell you. No. Right question is this. Um, I... In this context, I want to give the Lord what he wants. I'm not sure what that is. Can you help me understand so that I can go to the Lord and ask him if, this, if these things be so? That's a good heart posture. Wrong question or wrong position, maybe better said, is, you know, well, I have this thing over here that is equally important, or I've already got it all figured out, or X, Y, Z. We need a heart. I need a heart of humility. I do not want to miss the Lord because of ego and pride in this time. There's so many things that I have thought that have turned out to be wrong. <laughs> True? Maybe I'm just the only one. But I'm just saying, I want to be pliable to the Lord because I want something. I want to want what He wants, and I want to give Him what He wants. That's the right heart, heart posture. I want to be aligned with the will of God corporately. I want to be a part of a people who are corporately pursuing Christ and are committed to being obedient to the will of God. Wherever that takes me, whatever that looks like. 
I don't have a dog in the race outside of Lord. You bought me. You bought me with a price. I am yours. I am not my own. Do with me as you will. That's what Mary said. Let it be done unto me according to your will. Look what happened to her. Son of God, son of man was birthed through her. That was Mary's cry. That was Hannah's cry. Now, those are natural women. God's looking for a spiritual Mary, a spiritual Hannah. The will of God so that Christ can come forth and come back. So unity, unity. We have to have the Spirit of God is pressing for unity in the body of Christ. Again, not unity just so we can all like each other and we can hang out and eat together and, you know, not say bad things about each other behind each other's backs. That'll be a real miracle. Talk about miracles. <laughs> the church ever gets there. No. It's more than that. It's not less than that, but it's more than that. You know, I'm going to be negative for a second. Satan has instituted a wrong unity movement in the body of Christ. And it's basically around, um, it's not around purpose. It's around giving up our own purpose to just come together. It sounds good, but it's missing the life of what God wants. God is wanting to unify the church of Jesus Christ not around our purposes, which is what we have to lose, but around his purpose. That has to dominate. And that will deal with a lot of the nonsense that we get caught up with towards each other if that purpose can become the main thing. If his purpose will individually and corporately be our direction, the course of our life daily, weekly, yearly all the annoyances we have of each other and all that stuff will eventually begin to fade and we'll experience something called the fellowship of the spirit we are fellowshipping we are eating we are partaking of this one and we are committed to this one's will completely and totally in our hearts in our homes, in the corporate man. When we come together, this is about the Lord and Him getting what He wants. What if we, you know, this sounds beautiful, almost too good to, to be true. What if we had 100%, whatever church we're a part of, everyone on the same page. I am coming not just to hear a man speak, not just to hear a message. I am coming and not just coming to a meeting. I am here to see the Lord get what he wants. I may not have full understanding of it, but that's why I'm here. That's why I exist. My course is set daily to that reality. I'm pressing forward and I'm not going to allow the enemy to make me look back and return from where I was before. It's over. It's final. It's set in stone. The Lord has planted himself as the chief cornerstone. Not just randomly so I box and beat the air. Intentionally, there is a race set before me. There was a race set before us. There was a race, I'm going to say this, set before this body to run. And it's not random. Isn't that true, Brian and Ken? Many of you who've been here for a long time, you understand the processes of God to continue to hone the purpose of God. Isn't that right? It's been painful, hadn't it? It's cost a lot. And it's ongoing. It's ongoing with us. I'm not saying we've arrived. I'm just saying something is set in our hearts. It's the will of God or our church doesn't need to exist. It's the way we feel here at the gathering. There at the gathering. I know Brian and Ken feel that way. God isn't getting what he wants, and we're not going to give God what he wants, then we don't need to come together. We can do our own thing individually. Why come together if we're not going to journey together towards the same goal? That's just called a waste of time. 
You know, and I don't like football as much as I used to, but I can do a lot of other things with my Sundays, you know, watch football, do other things. I mean, it's about as fruitful as not coming around the Lord's purpose together. How sad would it be to be together for so long and seemingly walk together but never come on the right ground together as a body? That's just called a waste of time. I'm not saying that at all is what's going on here. That is not what I'm saying. I'm looking more generally across the body of Christ. We do so much stuff, Christian stuff. But the question is, is God really getting what he wants? Let's take that to the next level. We live, regardless of where we think we are in time, we live in abnormal times. This is a historical time. Like I said, I study history. I understand cycles of history, the rise and fall of nations, the rise and fall of um, evil and then periods of enlightenment. We are in a time of darkness and coming into darkness. That's the cycle we're in. Whether we see the end or not, and it's not really based on the cycle, it's based on the Lord calling out to a church to be made ready. But all the cycles have been about in my mind. Satan, when he hears that, he goes off autopilot mode to control the earth. Control the airwaves. Control what we're fed. Control what we consume. Why? To distract and to delay the coming of the Lord. Again, we're back to that. <laughs> Hitting this so we can understand. So we won't be tossed about by every wave and wind of doctrine. And so we understand our need to stand in this time, even at a governmental level, and pray for this nation. This nation is not meant to be under the hand of evil. He doesn't have authority outside of the measure of authority that we have given him. To the level that we have outsourced Governing ourselves, providing for ourselves, protecting ourselves. That's the measure that the enemy has in the government to consume that responsibility. We've been outsourcing our governance for a long time. And so we've become like the other nations who are easily controlled. That's why this is not a political thing. It has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. This has to do with preserving God's will to have a nation at the end that is a sheep nation that Satan can't get his hands on. And we're in the throes of that battle. And it does not mean that the remnant cannot be made ready in this nation if Satan wins out in this, in, in this time, in this nation, specifically America. However, God's purpose for this nation is not to come under that level of control. So in that sense, for me personally, I believe that. So I'm going to stand with the Lord in that, yes. even if it costs me my life. Yes. Not because I want to die for America, but because I'll die for the purpose of God. Yes. You may not be convinced of that. Ask the Lord about it. One thing I am convinced of is the vessel I'm talking about, though. That's a non-negotiable. Yes. So, what time is it? 12 o'clock. All right. Isaac spoke for an hour, right? I've only been up here like 30 minutes. I'm <laughs> no, just joking. So, uh, 2 Corinthians, and then we'll kind, of, uh, we'll kind of close down here for today. I wanted to bring this out because I believe this passage here in 2 Corinthians 11... Uh, one and four, spoke about this for a minute already, is the antithesis of what God wants in the vessel. Am I using that right word? It's the opposite of what the Lord's going to have in this woman. Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 11, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you, with a godly jealousy. God, here, hear me. God is jealous for you. You hear that? In love. He's jealous for his people. 
He's jealous for you to, like a husband, to be his wife and only his wife. Not have many husbands. Not have many lovers. The Lord is jealous for you. Paul being that vessel who's tasked with helping make the bride ready. And hear me, the John the Baptist vessel is not the end goal. The bridal vessel is not the end goal. The Lord himself and the glory of God himself is the end goal. This vessel, the bridal vessel, the John the Baptist vessel, who's tasked with helping make the bride ready in the portion that's allotted to him, it's all done ultimately, like Brian was saying, by the Holy Spirit. But like, just like the angels of God are given a task to minister to the heirs of salvation and protect, we all have certain missions that God divvies it out. God can do it himself individually without vessels to flow through if he really wanted. But he loves to use his creation. He longs to use his creation. But the Lord himself is the end goal. The friends of the bridegroom's joy is to see the bridegroom's joy to get the bride. Not just to see the bride made ready for the Lord. Yes, that's beautiful. But to see Christ get what he wants. That is the ultimate reward. Not even sitting with the Lord on his throne. As beautiful that is, that is and it's going to happen. Seeing the Lord get what he wants, what is due him, is the motivation. And this does get down to motivation. The Revelation 12 woman, what's her motivation? What's her cry? She's endured the process. She's endured the cross. Why? So that the purpose of God can be birthed. Like Hannah, the child is not hers. Hannah didn't even get the child. She didn't get to enjoy the child. What she had was the will of God accomplished. That has to be our motivation. Not set on outcomes. Not set on what we think the Lord's going to do. Just the Lord getting what he wants and being sold out to that purpose. May us only moving and acting and accepting or receiving of the Lord based on a certain outcome being accomplished be crushed in us forever. Yes. Amen? I want, that, I want that in me. Paul says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy for I betrothed, betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now as I'm reading this, just take the opposite of what he's saying. They're not. Again, this is the church. This is the body of Christ. This is not unbelievers. So if he's saying, this is what I intended for you, he's also saying, this is what you're not. Right? Um, people ask me, you know, why, you know, how can you believe that, you know, sorry, there's different dynamics with the bride and the church because the Bible says it. I can't go against the Bible. Paul's saying it right here. He's speaking to the church, the Corinthians church. I betrothed you as this. You're not this. You've been deceived and led away from Christ. He doesn't say you've lost your salvation. He said you're not walking in the level of bridal relationship that I've called you to. You see that in uh, Revelation 2 to the Ephesian church where Paul has this beautiful revelation in Ephesians of chapter 5 of Christ and his bride in the great mystery of Christ and, and the bride. And he gives that to the Ephesian church and they've read it, but Jesus himself comes in Revelation chapter 2, chapter 2 and says, you have lost your first love. I am not your husband. What can you say to that? I can't refute the Bible. I can't refute the words of Jesus himself. What does that make me do? It makes me fear God rightly. That if in that day, when you had not only the Lord, but then Paul the apostle and the apostles with the power 
and the wonders of God coming through them. And I can't even imagine, and maybe I'm wrong, but the anointing of the Lord on Paul to preach the gospel that he had been tasked with preaching. If they could leave their first love, if they could leave the bridal relationship and just have a form of Christianity, what could that mean for me? What could that mean for us? What could that mean for the church of Jesus Christ? But it equally, equally stirs something in me rightly to press on and to press the body of Christ on. To stand with boldness and courage and proclaim the truth of God, whether it's received or not, whether it's liked or not. Why? Because there's only one purpose, because Christ deserves what he wants. In Christ, I aim to be a part of Christ getting what he wants and proclaiming it. It's up to all of us whether we receive that, whether we go on that journey with the Lord. Paul says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, this you tolerate very well, what if we got to a place in the church when people come and preach a different Jesus, we just kicked them out? Now, of course, I guess that depends on what the church believes about Jesus to begin with because you guys could just kick me out. But then I could just go home and see my children, so that would be okay. No. <laughs> We've come to tolerate so much in the body of Christ, so much deception, so much unbiblical preaching. And we're too afraid to say anything. It's true. Hear me. It's the same thing's true in the political realm. It's the same spirit of cowardice that we've been lulled to sleep with for a long time. Unwilling to have a backbone to stand up. Anyway. So the antithesis to this is this. A pure virgin, speaking of the woman in Revelation 12, a pure virgin that is pure to Christ. A woman that will not tolerate another than Jesus, will not tolerate another than gospel, will not tolerate another than purpose. That has received the Holy Spirit the true spirit, and understands the work of the Holy Spirit to train us and to yield us and to make us like, in this way, conformed to the image of Christ, like the Lord. And if there's a Holy Spirit being preached, or a spirit, let me say that right, a spirit given pre, give, uh, being preached or given, that is not in the preponderance of that spirit being preached or given is not unto that goal, they will not receive it. Hear me. When the spirit being given is all about the outward, it is not the spirit of God. It's another than spirit. What spirit is at the end of the age? Great signs and false lying wonders. Outward. What's missing? Inward maturity and life. So the children who are not in a mature, mature state will be deceived because to them, as long as it works, that's what we're going to use. So now we have a whole section of the church that is trying all sorts of nonsense to get outward stuff done. Doesn't matter how it's done. Doesn't matter if it's done by the Spirit of God. Doesn't matter the source. As long as it works, we're going to do it. That's called another than spirit. We need to re, again, generally speaking here, we need to reread John 14, 15, 16, and 17 and the words of Jesus himself, why the Holy Spirit was given. Nowhere in there does it say that he's going to come and you're going to have all that stuff. Now, again, I understand the reality of it, but the emphasis of Christ 
is not that. The emphasis of the Lord is that where he is, we may be also. That's not just heaven. That's a life that is in him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, for you have died. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord's going to have it. I want to be a part of it. My prayer this morning for all of us is twofold. Generally, for the body of Christ. Specifically, for the body here. I could be just as specific in the body back at home at the gathering. That we could be a woman that has a cry in our heart, an inward groaning, that the purpose of God would be fulfilled not in another generation, in our generation. And that we would be motivated rightly so we would not go there quickly and then wash out quickly, which is what I've seen for a long time. That is responding to God in the soul. And it's going to end that way every single time. I want to come into covenant with the Lord. So that way there is an anchor called Christ for my soul when it's wayward as the Lord's dealing with it. You know, so much of our confusion is because we live out of our souls, try to understand God out of our soul, our own mind, our own will, and our own emotions. If we will not allow the cross of Christ to purge the authority that the soul as a vessel, as an organ has over us, we are never going to be able to come into place of surety with the Lord where we are unshakable and in an unshakable relationship. And if we're going to need anything in this time, it's going to be in that place of the secret place of the Most High, Psalm 91. Not just physically for protection, but spiritually because the days are evil. Hear me, God, is he going to even use the deception to test the validity of his bride? This is a a sad thought, and it's completely out of context, so you judge this. But I keep having this phrase that John the Baptist asked of Jesus, but it's flipped. Jesus asking of us, are you the right one or shall I look for another? Remember when John Baptist asked Jesus that about the Messiah? Are you the one or should we look for another? This thing in me that I feel the Lord is asking this generation, not this church, this generation, this vessel that is being made ready, I believe that. We're in the throes of it, the choices of it, the process of it. Are you the right one or shall I look for another? Will you too? This is what Jesus asked them when he spoke hard words. Will you then leave me too? Peter had the right answer. Where else can we go? I'll tell you what, guys. I am utterly convinced. I cannot hear these things and not be impacted deeply. And I know it's a process. I know it strikes against our solical, natural-mindedness in very many ways. I understand that it smacks against some of us. Years of Christian teaching. The Lord has gripped my heart to leave, let me say this rightly, to leave where He's brought me to. And this understanding of who He is and what He wants would be like leaving Him. Because I'm so convinced of the will of God in these matters can't go back to just the stuff. I can't go back to just the things. I can't go back to just normal church. And I'm not talking about being in a building and all that outward form. I'm talking about the inward form of being a whitewashed tomb. May we be the right vessel. I ask that even now, Lord. May we be the right vessel. That you would not have to look to another. You would not have to look to another time. Another day in the future. Another generation yet to be born. 
May we be the vessel that responds rightly. I ask, Spirit of God, even now, the inward man, if it's not there, ask that you would implant it within us to those who would receive it. The inward groaning and longing for the revealing of the sons or maybe better said the son or the sonship of God. That understand it's not just about the end of days. More importantly, it's about you getting what you want. But they are not exclusive. Mutually exclusive to one another. They are tied together. Lord, we ask that you would give us that groaning, that cry. And I ask, Spirit of God, that you would give us a unity with you and with one another in that purpose, that it would dominate us to the day you come, to the day we go to be with you. I ask that confusion and deception would be broken off of us. And I ask that your people, even here today, could hear your voice, not my voice. Not me just saying these things and saying, oh, just believe it because I said it. That's not what I'm saying. But I ask that your confirming spirit would go deep in the hearts of your people and grip and grab hold Lord, I ask ask that you'd help us not to be on autopilot spiritually. I ask that you would help us not to categorize what's going on right now, not during this message, but in this time. What's coming forward as, um, oh yeah, well, I've heard it all before and we've heard all this before. Help us to understand that what's being talked about is becoming something. Not just something's going to happen. Becoming something. Being the right vessel unto you. Help us to respond to you in that, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would awaken us. Awaken us from sleep. Awaken us from slumber. Lord, there is a spirit of slumber that the enemy has sown in your church. I ask that it would have no place or part on us, in us, through us, over us, I ask for alertness and sobriety to your people. I ask that you'd break it off of us right now. We would have the helmet of salvation clothed with the full armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit, shield of faith, spirit of God, that we could stand in this time, not half-heartedly, but whole-heartedly, not complacent or satisfied with the little bit that we possess. You said those who have more will be given, who believe you. Would we believe you? We're not just believing you for timelines. We're believing you that you're looking for a vessel. You're looking for a people who are not their own, who've been bought with a price. You're looking for a people that would enter into Canaan and would see the ites driven out. It would see the temple rebuilt and would see the wall rebuilt around that temple. And that place with you in that land, our land, our heart, would be secured. And the Shekinah glory of God, Christ, would come and dwell again in that temple. The temple Ezekiel saw. 
Not a temple built by human hands, but a temple in the spirit that Abraham was looking for. A city. Lord, in Revelation chapter 22, where Christ is on the throne in the center of the city. And there is living water coming from out from under the throne, giving life. Lord, we're asking for your throneship to be established within us. What we're meant to be, the true city of God, to that level. We don't want to have uh, two kings in our hearts. As Jesus was very clear, you can't have two masters. You love one and hate the other, or hate the one and love the other. Thus the battle of soul and spirit. We're looking for Christ to be on the throne and to have no rivals in our inward man or our outward man. No rivals individually, no rivals corporately for Christ to be all in all. To see Christ as the all in all now. And to be a part of that now. And then at your coming, to see you fill the entire universe. To you and to see you be the all in all that you are. But Lord, bring it right home, right now, to my own heart, to my family, to my home, to this people here. Lord, we're asking for it now. We're crying out for it now. We are proclaiming to you, Lord, and don't do this unless you mean it. I mean it. We are proclaiming to you, Lord, that we want to be that right vessel that the will and the purpose of God can be birthed through. And it would not be aborted. <laughs> How's that? That we would go through the cost and the difficulty and the pains of birthing the will of God. We would endure it. Why? Because of love. 1 Corinthians 13, love endures all things. The true love of God in Christ established in his bride will endure all things for the will of God. May we be gripped by that love. May that love be established in me. Not human solical love that it fails and falters, especially when self-preservation kicks in. But the love of God that sacrifices, there is no greater love than this, than one that lays down his life for his friends. Lord, we long to be your friend who knows what his master is doing and has the love of God established to endure whatever is required. Lord, I ask that you'd put your finger on hearts right now. Awaken, awaken. That which has been allowed to die, seeds, seed of God. I'm talking about loss of salvation here. I'm talking about this, this, that which is coupled with his purpose. Place your finger on it now. To bring forth life again. Bring forth life. May the cares, the concerns, the thorns, the thistles, the birds of the air not be able to steal the seed that's meant to grow and dominate the garden of our heart. Holy Spirit, Spirit, minister to your people right now, I ask. Spiritually rejuvenate the heart. Equally, bring our soul in subjection to your lordship. Make it where it's not able to drown you out again. That's the ultimate challenge. The Lord can continue to awaken. But unless our souls are dealt with, 
the same thing will continue to happen. Lord, deal with our soul and awaken us inwardly by your spirit to you once again, to yourself, not to stuff, to you. We bless you, Lord. We love you. And we want to love you rightly. Lord, we I'll say this, and we'll be done. Lord, I, we accept the challenge to be your vessel in this time. Because it is a challenge. Knowing full well that in our own strength, we cannot accomplish it. Unless you build and complete the house, it'll never happen. We accept the challenge to be living stones that are builded, that are erected into a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. Completed, not just halfway built and abandoned. Completed. I feel like we could go on more, but I'm not going to. I just ask, Lord, that you would continue to work on our hearts, my own included. I'm not just my own heart. Deal with coldness. What you said in that day of the end, that the love of many would grow cold. That wasn't toward each other. That was towards you. May I have no coldness in my heart towards you. Like Isaac was saying, may there be no areas, coldness, that I would not allow you to warm and to heat with the consuming fire of your life. Continue that work, Lord. I ask for deep conviction where it's needed. coupled with it understanding, spiritual wisdom. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for who you are and your commitment to your will that involves us in such a great measure. Thank you. We bless you. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. That was an awesome message, and it's probably a message you guys need to go back and listen to again. There's a lot of stuff packed into that. It was incredible. But uh, we're going to go ahead right now and dismiss you for today, and then we'll be back at 630. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Have an awesome lunch, and hopefully get some rest, and we'll see you back at 630. Amen.